work with Southern Ophthalmology in Wollongong. Um, I also have a practice in Annandale. I work in Randwick and I'm on staff at Prince of Wales Hospital. And I specialise in medical retina and neuro-ophthalmology. And tonight I'm going to explore visual field constriction and the causes we need to think about. Starting with a case history of a 67 year old woman who has a past history of temporal lobe epilepsy following a head injury. She fell from a Ferris wheel as a child and she's on Tegretol. She just went along for a glasses check, no particular symptoms. She was found to have normal vision, normal fundus exam, but she had very abnormal fields. Um, you can see from uh, this picture, there's a lot of peripheral loss, the false negative errors are also quite high. So what was done was repeat field, which is even worse. Um, although the false negative errors were a little bit uh, better, at least for the left eye. So this leads on to the general problem of uh, what can cause constricted visual fields with normal acuity. So here's my little list. Uh, glaucoma is obviously up the top of the list. Uh, papilledema, dystrusin, optic nerve sheath meningioma, optic neuritis, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, retinitis pigmentosa, some drug toxicities, and, um, and even bilateral occipital infarcts with macular sparing. So I'll just go through, go through this. I'm not going to talk about glaucoma much because you, um, we've got another talk on glaucoma coming up you know, we can see the enlarged cup disc ratio. So this is papilledema with some disc swelling. And visual field constriction is one of the most important signs of progressive optic neuropathy in papilledema. Um, and this should actually be read in reverse order because uh, this is how this particular patient improved after shunting. Uh, for idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So talking more about idiopathic intracranial hypertension, the most common group is the overweight young woman. They can have symptoms of raised intracranial pressure, which include headache, nausea, pulsatile tinnitus, um, which is like a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh um, in time with your pulse transient visual obscurations and diplopia. They shouldn't have anything else. And what you can see is disc swelling or pallor. They may or may not have a field defect and they're allowed to have a sixth nerve palsy, which is a non-localizing sixth. Neuroimaging is normal. The CSF content should be normal, but the CSF pressure is raised. There are a bunch of different drugs that can be associated with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Most commonly tetracycline, vitamin A, lithium and most modern contraceptive pills don't really cause a problem and you need to monitor acuity, color vision, field and disc appearance and treatment involves weight loss, medical treatment with dimox or topiramate, CSF shunting, uh, stenting of the cortical uh, veins and optic nerve sheath fenestration. And this is a case of dystrusin, and you may be able to, you should be able to see, hopefully even online, um, just the sense of a lumpy pale edge, uh, most obvious up top. The visual field loss in dystrusin can actually be quite severe, although fortunately it's not usually this severe, and it consists of multiple nerve fiber layer um, defects, which leads to this general moth-eaten appearance. Um, and optic nerve sheath meningioma can also cause a problem. And, and this is a case of a 47 year old woman who was referred from a neurologist with a diagnosis of atypical optic neuritis. She was diagnosed as optic neuritis because she had pain on eye movement. Um, and it was thought to be atypical because her disc swelling lasted too long. And she had normal visual acuity, normal color vision. And so this, and review of the MRI demonstrated the optic nerve sheath meningioma. So what happened to her, her vision remained excellent, um, but she had 
develop progressive field constriction and an increased relative afferent pupillary defect. Eventually, I referred her off for stereotactic radiation because you can't operate on these tumours. Um, and she actually did quite well. But uh, this shows her progression until her referral. Don't forget about optic neuritis. These, um, this figure is from the optic neuritis treatment trial. And you should remember that although the field loss with optic neuritis is typically central, um, the whole 30 degree field is central and you can have any pattern of um, Humphrey visual field loss, including constriction with optic neuritis. And anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is not uncommon uh, cause of constriction, particularly if you're lucky, the patient's lucky enough to get central sparing. Uh, the next, so this is, this is a very old case, but um, you can see the, the right eye sustained, the left eye had remained very stable over an eight year period with a very small retained central window field. And unfortunately the right eye had suffered from um, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in the interim. Retinitis pigmentosa, that's, that's um, fairly obvious um, when the fundus findings are as significant as this with retinal atrophy and bone spicule changes. But the changes aren't, fundus changes aren't always obvious. The typical scotoma is initially a ring scotoma um, and then progresses um, both anteriorly and posteriorly to leave only a small retained eyelid in classic um, retinitis pigmentosa. Now, here for some more canaries. Um, Vigabatrin is very rarely used now, but when it was first introduced, um, there was quite an alarming rate of peripheral field loss with up to 50% of patients being affected. Now, this is a field you don't see very often these days. This is a merged 60 degree Humphrey field um, where a central 30 degrees and then 30 to 60 is merged. And this is the Vigabatrin field. And this is what it should look like. And that's just the Goldman. It uh, was indicated for complex epilepsy. It was introduced in the UK in the late 1980s, but it never got uh, US FDA approved because of the very high rate of visual field constriction. Um, so yeah, it's rare to see it now. Quinine is another, quinine toxicity is another um, quite alarming situation. You'll notice here in the picture on the left, the marked constriction of the retinal arterioles. And this is the Goldman field. The usual setting in which quinine toxicity is seen is either a deliberate overdose, either a suicide attempt or uh, to induce miscarriage or with intravenous drug users uh, where it's often used to cut the drug. Um, they can come in blind with unreactive pupils um, but very often they regain a small central visual field and usually with excellent acuity, but a tiny visual field. And then they end up getting the disc pallor and the arteriolar attenuation. And siderosis with a retained eye and foreign body is also over time quite toxic and causes visual field constriction. And finally, if you're unlucky enough to have bilateral cortical uh, occipital lesions, but fortunate enough to have some macular sparing, um, you can also have visual field constriction. And this on the fields you look for a notch along the vertical meridian. So what happened with this case? Um, wave of the magic wand and she had normal visual fields. So what was going on there? You've guessed it already. It's she had a visual field artifact. Um, so why? does this happen? 
it can happen from a variety of physical factors like lens room artifact can happen if there's incorrect refraction, pupils too large or small, they've got ptosis, patient's not attending, the patient wants, doesn't want to do a good field or from innocent response bias. And I'll go over these two. So this is a beautiful ring scotoma um, from a lens room artifact, which we may go away. Um, incorrect refraction or small pupil will more typically just cause decreased sensitivity. Ptosis and incorrect, incorrect head posture causes a superior defect. And this is a classical clover, four leaf clover uh, from the patient just not paying attention. The, the initial points tested are in the center of the, the four clover leaves and the patient just loses uh, concentration for the rest. Now, getting on to motivation, the, to test for spiraling or overlapping isopters is one of the two reasons I still keep a Goldman field machine around. But finally, this is a very old paper, but it's quite instructive. So it studied the effect of the patient, instru the patient instructions given uh, for the visual field test on their performance. And I'll just read the conservative instructions. On this test, you'll be able to see half of the stimuli that are presented. We want you to be certain that you see a light before pressing the button. Do not respond if you are unsure. If you respond while there is no light presented, the test time will increase and an error will be recorded. Remember, you will not be able to see all the lights that are presented. Make sure you are certain a light was presented before pressing the button. Now, I'm sure no one would give instructions like that. You might give neutral instructions though. Always look straight ahead at the steady yellow light. Other lights will flash one at a time off to the side. Some will be bright, some dim. Press the button whenever you see one of these flashes. You are not expected to see all of them. The best time for you to blink is just as you press the button. They're reasonable instructions. But how many of us give instructions like this? On this test, we are trying to find the dimmest light that you can see. The test will push you to see very dim targets. We want you to press the button as soon as you think you might see a light. There is no penalty for guessing. In fact, we encourage guessing. Remember the test is trying to push you to see very dim targets. Now, what happens? In the younger patient population, Nothing much happens with the different instructions, although there are more peripheral defects. But look what happens to the older population. There can be very, very marked apparent visual field loss with the conservative instru instructions. So what they found was that older subjects generally had lower visual sensitivity by a small amount, and the conservative instructions yielded a dramatically different overall sensitivity between young and old patients. The visual sensitivity of a central point was not affected, but the peripheral sensitivities were dramatically affected. The instruction type did not affect the false negatives, fixation losses, or short-term fluctuation. And there were more false positive errors with liberal uh, instructions, but not enough to make a significant difference to the fields. So in other words, the take home message is for older subjects, you really do need to give liberal instructions, even to the ridiculous, if you think you might see a light, press the button, because uh, otherwise you can get really weird fields and uh, that can be clinically significant. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll hand over now to uh, Dr. Flax.